So uh, last night, um, James and his wife, Kate, actually, James didn't do anything. James, uh, <laughs> his wife, though, cooked us this fabulous uh, dinner. So if you're in the room, thank you. Um, and I had the pleasure to meet some of the Percolate folks and, uh, and some of the others who are here today. And uh, I uh, found myself sort of complaining about a rich world um, problem I have, and it's cathartic to complain, so I'm going to share it with you. I have a three-year-old daughter, Yara, uh, and so I'm an engineer by training. I'm a bit of a geek. My wife's a ch child psychologist. We read too many books about parenting. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, she was wearing this necklace thingy, and uh, she refused to take it off. And so I was like, yeah, that, why don't you want to take it off? And she said, because it makes me pretty. My heart broke. And I immediately huddled with my wife. And I was like, where did she hear this? What the hell is going on? Um, and of course, you know, it's not surprising because um, pay attention to this. Next time you're around a little girl, listen to what the grown-ups say to her. Because nine times out of 10, the, the comment will be something about how pretty you are. And this is all she's gonna hear from the outside world when she's not in school at her safe little Montessori or at home when I'm trying to teach her songs about gravity. Um, <laughs> but so the next time you see a little girl, please ask them a question. Say, hey, where are you going? Why are you going there? Why are you wearing those shoes? And don't say they're pretty. Um, but you know, these are rich, uh, these are really great problems to have. There are parents uh, and kids around the world who have harder problems, right? Um, one in 10 girls uh, will, are being raped or will be sexually abused before they're 20 today around the world. Six million kids under five will die every year of a cause we can prevent like malnutrition or malaria, like these are easy things. Um, but it doesn't have to be this, it doesn't have to be, right? And um, we now live in a world where I have a really smart AI in a device in my pocket that will predict that I need toilet paper before I even know it and a drone will drop it off at my door. Like this is real, it's happening. Um, but what if we, started to apply those same approaches and that same kind of thirst for improving our lives all over the world. And I think we're at a moment now where we can do that. Um, and the proliferation of devices and, and the ability to actually um, understand the data that we now are producing um, can really change the world we live in. And I hope that by the time Yara is, you know, 20 and getting out of college and thinking about what do I want to do, uh, we will have solved these problems. Like we, there shouldn't be a child under five who's dying of uh, malnutrition. Really those things should go away so our kids can start solving some really um, harder problems um, that we have not ignored. So, uh, you know, we produce about two and a half quintillion bytes of data. Uh, every day. I don't know how many digits that is. It's a lot. Um, all the social media posts, the videos, photos, um, all your transactions that are being recorded. And a lot of that is being driven by the proliferation of smartphones. Um, over a billion smartphones shipped last year. Interestingly, most of it to developing countries, top four markets in terms of unit volume, China, India, Brazil, um, and Indonesia. Um, so you might think like, oh my gosh, everyone's living in this Uber Yelp world that we are, but, but it's not true. And you might not be surprised that smartphone penetration in most of the developing world is actually quite low. Now it's gonna change uh, with low cost Android devices, et cetera, uh, but that's not the world we're living in that many of our citizens are living in today. And if you look a little bit closer, uh, it's not just at a national level, so in India, 30% smartphone penetration. If you look at rural India, 900 million people, um, less than 7% have internet access. And so the, every day that goes by, the loss in opportunity and health and safety uh, is hard to imagine. So we've gotta do something about this today, not when 
internet.org and Google Loon and um, cheaper Android phones start to reach the, the hardest to reach kids and families and communities. Um, so thankfully not everyone's waiting around. There's a startup called Innos. They've um, uh, pivoted a couple times. They used to be called Innos. Um, they, within a year and a half, increased internet access in India by 50%. They um, built out a offline search model, so you text using your feature phone, it goes to a human and a machine that does an online query search and texts you the results back. 120 million people using Inos to get online. And you compare that to about 250 million people in India with internet access. So Inos have open source their model. Uh, they're called offlineinternet.org. They're in about 10 countries. Hundreds of millions of people today are getting online using a feature phone. Um, the, uh, so, so access is, is changing. Um, data still is hard. So uh, in, in many countries, a typical data plan, monthly data plan, will cost you about 20 hours of income. That's a lot if you're barely getting by and every hour of income is a meal that your family might have. Um, and again, there's exciting stuff um, with balloons and drones that will get internet access, hopefully, uh, much more cheaply to everyone who needs it. Um, but there are also some interesting things happening today. Um, Jana started off essentially recognizing that uh, most people who have a feature phone need to pay for airtime, you're paying as you go, it's incredibly valuable. And so they partnered up with about 250 mobile operators, um, including integrating with their financial systems. And they created immediate reach to three and a half billion, um, essentially citizens in developing countries and turned it into a research platform for big brands who are looking at the base of the pyramid. One instant poll can get you five million responses in exchange for what people cared about the most, airtime. Um, they've now pivoted and they are essentially um, rewarding those same people with data because data is um, more important than airtime today. And data is important not just for uh, individuals who are trying to get online, who are trying to access information that can change their lives. It's important for societies. It's important for countries. Um, this month, those of some of you may be paying attention, uh, the UN General Assemblies happens all every September in, uh, in New York and everyone hates it because it blocks up the entire uh, east side. Uh, but we're announcing the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, the Millennium Development Goals, which were the precursor announced in 2000, were very bold and they wanted to eradicate extreme poverty and cut um, child mortality in half and we've made lots of progress. Um, but interestingly, it's really hard to measure progress uh, because we don't have access to data. So um, the first Millennium Development Goal around um, eradicating poverty, there's a three year time lag between when we can know uh, and, and sort of have a point of view on how we're doing and when that data is coming from, right? Goal two uh, is no better um, around universal access to primary education. Four year time lag. So the strategies we're programming today to increase access, uh, reduce barriers like school fees or quality of education, training teachers, four year old data. That's really hard to run any kind of business, organization, operation, program um, with that kind of data. And you know, it goes on. So we're now at a time where this no longer needs to be the case. We actually can have access to real-time data. We can be much uh, more responsive to what's working, what's not. Um, UNICEF, by the way, uh, the Millennium Development Goals had about 35 or so metrics. Um, UNICEF uh, was getting source household level data for 17 of those metrics. Uh, and we care a lot about data and we sort of use that data to inform not just the work we're doing but our kind of nonprofit partners um, as well as informing governments to try to push that fiscal space out of where should you be investing your health budget? Uh, because at the end of the day, the exit for UNICEF and we're at about 190 countries is either families are lifted out of poverty and that's gonna take generations. In some places it's happening faster than others or governments take over the services. Um, 
And so we've got to have strong evidence of where the need is and what's working to be able to influence governments to do what we think the children and, and families um, in their countries need most. So uh, the time lag aside, precision also matters. So when we l talk about the Millennium Development Goals and progress, we talk at the national level. So if you look at Brazil, uh, and that's uh, sort of color coded there, green is good, uh, child mortality is fairly low. Now if you look at it at the state level, it's a different picture. Uh, red is really bad. So what this starts to mean is, well, even though Brazil is a middle-income country, it's an emerging market, although you know, not necessarily growing right now, um, but there's enough wealth and there's progress. But it's actually not distributed across the country. It's concentrated. If you then look at it even further at a municipal level, um, it looks even more interesting and in some cases disappointing because there are pockets of inequity everywhere. Um, and the more precise we can be in knowing where those problems are, the better we can be in addressing them. The more current we can be in understanding where what's working and what's not, the more responsive that can be. And, and we're now at a time where we can do that. So a few years ago, UNICEF's Innovation Unit, um, started by a couple colleagues, uh, Chris Fabian and Erica Kochi, uh, built uh, a open source SMS based platform called Rapid SMS. Um, and they understood that, you know, if you're really going to solve these problems, we can't go drop smart devices into communities that were off grid with no power, no bandwidth, and no 3G. And then the variable cost of each device you drop in there is prohibitive to scale any kind of program. But s feature phones existed. So they built a platform on top of. Um, feature phones that was SMS based. Today there are thousands of developers around the world who build, continue to build out rapid SMS. Um, and it allowed us to do things that not, uh, that before that were not possible. Um, birth registration is something that most of us probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about. But over 200 million kids around the world today um, are not registered. They don't have a birth certificate, which means they don't exist. Right, so they can't actually, they'll never get a passport, uh, never mind a passport. It's, um, their chances of getting access to basic government services are also diminished. So it's hugely important they don't exist. And to fix that uh, was a really hard thing to do because a birth certificate is a paper-based thing, even in the US, it's a paper-based thing. You have to go to a birth registrar, the government's office may or may not be open, there's no way to have any oversight of what's actually going on. So in Nigeria, we rolled out, uh, using the Rapid SMS platform, um, a very simple birth registration system that essentially in, uh, meant that every time a birth happened, a text message went from wherever that birth happened to a central government database. And then that data could be used to compare the actual paper records coming from each district so that if there was a gap, gov the government could then know that someone's not doing their job and they could, fig they could put pressure and actually change what was happening. So uh, not too long ago, I think in 2007, 30% of births in Nigeria were registered Last year, close to 100% were. And it didn't cost much at all. In fact, it didn't cost anything. We used text messages. Um, rapid SMS also was used in a bunch of applications around health. So uh, infants uh, who are born to mothers with HIV have a decent chance that uh, they may get infected with HIV. It's hard to know if they have or have not been infected until about six months after birth because the virus hasn't expressed itself. Once you find out though, and you've got to find out very quickly, you don't have a lot of time to put that infant on antiretroviral treatment. If you don't, within a matter of months, um, then the chances of that child developing HIV are much higher um, and the chances of that child living are much lower. If you're in rural Zambia, here's how this works. Um, mom will go to a community clinic that's maybe a few hours from the village and get a test. It's a, it's a uh, blood spot thing, so it's a piece of 
physical thing that then has the uh, blood that has to go from the community clinic through rural roads to a district hospital, from the district hospital by road to a central lab in the capital, and then they'll run the tests, and then you have a result, and it has to go back the same way. So let's just say the results weren't getting to the parents and the kids who needed it in time. Um, we rolled out a project uh, uh, in Zambia, starting in Zambia, and it's now in a number of countries called Moana, which essentially used um, community health workers' phones so that when uh, a birth happened, a text message went out, and the community health worker was encouraged to bring mom into the clinic to uh, get her initial checkup, but more importantly, at six months, a reminder went out to bring mom back so that the child could be tested for HIV. Today what happens is that blood report uh, still needs to go from the community clinic to the central lab, but as soon as it's processed, the result goes by text message instantly to the community health worker who's with mom, who brings her to the clinic, and she has a result. So we cut that time in half. Now it's getting really interesting where um, the team in Zambia are starting to experiment with the potential for low cost drones to cut the first half of that journey um, time by you know, 99%. So what if you could actually have a drone pick that up to up that blood report, bring it back to the central lab and send a text message back with the result? It's happening, right? It's possible. Drones are still too expensive. We're still a few years away, but it's possible and it's within sight. Um, we've also started using text messaging to just get young people um, involved in what's happening in their countries and what's happening in their communities. Uh, there's a, a platform called U-Report uh, that was launched in Uganda uh, three or four years ago that's now scaling. It's in 15 countries. There's a million you reporters who, uh, most of whom, about 95% of whom are under the age of 30 across uh, pretty much most of sub, uh, many countries in, in Sub-Saharan and, and West Africa. Um, what's fantastic about this is with you report, so you know, you're all, many of you are marketers, you know, you, you know what response rates are like. When you send out a text message with you report, we get 30, 40% response rates. And the questions that are asked are important enough that these young people will take the time to respond. So in Uganda, initially it was started to, uh, it was used as a polling system. Um, you know, uh, what do you, uh, do you think that uh, corporal punishment should, is okay in uh, primary schools? Well, when that question went out, 99% of your reporters said absolutely not. Within two weeks, the government had passed legislation to ban corporal punishment across the entire country. That's why we get a response rate. And, and when young people start to feel, see that their voice matters, they start to get engaged. We're now using it for all kinds of um, applications, including early surveillance of disease outbreaks, um, informing policy. In Uganda, every single one of 200 something parliamentarians is on your report. And now they use your report to pull their um, sort of constituencies before they go into vote. So every time there's a vote on the floor, they can get an instant poll of what do my, what do my constituents think about this? Because I need to know and I, since I'm representing them. It's now possible with a dumb phone. Um, this, uh, uh, so the other a dimension to your report is it's all transparent. So every single poll is on a website. It, every country has its own website, and everyone can see the results. So there's no hiding behind um, the results there. This was a poll that went out in Uganda um, around uh, water, uh, water points. So is, is your water access point working? Instantly, we had 6,000 response that was responses fairly distributed around the country about where it was and wasn't. That's really incredibly valuable information if you're overseeing a program around access to safe water because you know where you need to look. You know where the breakpoints are. Over time, you can detect the patterns and you can tie them to other macro variables that then allow you to predict when the next um, sort of failure and when and where the next failure might happen. Uh, we've taken rapid SMS and a lot of these apps and essentially put it in the cloud, and we've 
launched a platform called Rapid Pro, which we like to call the App Store for International Development, where any government, any nonprofit, any group can essentially use some of the modules we've already built and put together a um, vaccine surveillance system or a birth registration system. Um, we've seen some of the early applications of this. Uh, one was called EduTrack, used in Afghanistan, where uh, you know a lot of kids never went to school, and so UNICEF has a number of programs to get adolescents back into school in a compressed way, in an accelerated way. If you're in Kandahar, you know you can't get to these teachers um, to deliver curriculum or keep track of what they're doing or support them in any way, when even when uh, teachers exist. So. EduTrack allows, uh, puts teachers on this SMS platform, they can share lesson plans, um, we can prompt, uh, kind of uh, push out information, we can track data around attendance, figure out what's working. Um, we, when uh, the Ebola crisis was at its peak, we uh, built out a, uh, an app called mHero that essentially was a uh, patient tracing system um, and, a, um, and a communication system for healthcare workers because there was a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, people were frightened uh, by what might and might not be. Uh, the health, entire health systems were collapsing in, in the countries that were affected. Turned out in Liberia though, 98% of health workers had a feature phone, so we could reach them instantly. So we partnered with USAID, the, the US government's um, aid agency, who already had built out a database of a few hundred thousand healthcare workers. And suddenly we had instant access to a few hundred thousand healthcare workers who could share things like drug stockouts, who, to whom we could push out messaging around Ebola and prevention and what was working and what wasn't, who could report back um, cases they were seeing, who, whom we could uh, connect with to track patients uh, across different clinics. Um, and all of that was possible in the space of a few weeks because we now have this cloud-based sy cloud system that has enough of the right modules that you could put together. Um, even I might be able to do it, um, although probably not, um, and, and do it very quickly. UNICEF launched um, a challenge this spring uh, with, uh, in partnership with Frog and Arm, uh, which was a wearables for good challenge. So we've started to look at devices data being the place we started at, because now costs are coming down enough um, and there's enough um, excitement around some of the problems we can now solve that uh, once we start connecting data and, and devices. Um, some of the ideas we've now picked a round of finalists, um, the two winners will be announced uh, in November. Uh, they're, they're ideas from all over the world. I think 40 countries had Young people, groups, companies submit um, applications. Anything from, you know, uh, uh, a wearable that contained uh, that uh, water purification, um, in case you were in a rural part of the country and you didn't know the quality of the water, or a safety device for young children to prevent abuse or exploitation. So there's a kind of whole range of use cases. Uh, before we did that, we uh, last year in the U.S. we launched. Um, what we'd like to think is the world's first wearable for good uh, called UNICEF Kid Power. I'm wearing one right now. Uh, and it's a very simple idea. You know, kids wear this band. It's for uh, elementary school age kids. Uh, they get active. They earn kid power points. The points are converted to packets of therapeutic food for severely malnourished kids around the world. Kids get active. They save lives. Um, and what's been fantastic about Kid Power is we've rolled it out in uh, Title I schools in the US, in elementary schools. Um, in settings where, right here in the US, uh, you know, we're in schools where there's no Wi-Fi, uh, the teacher's never seen a tablet, um, and yet, by giving kids the power to make change and create change and be agents of change, we've rolled out this program to hundreds of third, fourth, fifth grade classrooms, and the teachers love it because they don't have to do anything, because if you put a tablet in front of a third grade teacher and a third grader, neither of whom have seen one, guess who's gonna figure it out? Um, and if you let a child know that, hey, the more you move, the more kids you're gonna help, guess what they're gonna do? So we've had third graders uh, starting a walking club in their school because they wanna earn points and unlock packets of food. We've had an eight-year-old girl who insisted that her mom take her for walks every day after school so she could earn more points 
and unlock more packets and, and on and on and on. Um, and what, uh, what we're doing now in the next, uh, actually two weeks, is launching a retail version of this so every family can have their kids uh, participate. And the thing that um, kid power is based on, it's a very simple idea, that, and, and it's a simple belief, which really is that all kids have this inherent desire to do good. And all, all grown-ups do too, it's just we've forgotten about it. We don't have time for it. We don't pay attention to a desire we all do have to help others. And there's enough evidence around, you know, what makes you happy helping people. Um, but kids especially are close to that desire. And if you can unlock it, if you reduce the friction between them and realizing it, magic happens. And that's what we're seeing with Kid Power. And I'd say with, as part of UNICEF, um, this is our core belief. You know, the, the way we are going to change the world, our theory of change is very simple. It's harness the power of children because children will be the force and the most powerful force that can drive change uh, for the next generation. So the next time you see a kid, and if it's a girl, don't tell her she's pretty, ask them a question. You should be trying to figure out how they're gonna change the world because they will, and you'll be thanking them for it. Thank you.